If you've been curious about why New York Mayor Mike Bloomberg endorsed Barack Obama for re-election, just take another look at the havoc caused by the Frankenstorm benignly named Sandy. Having surveyed all this damage, Bloomberg Businessweek concluded, it's global warming, stupid. If Hurricane Sandy doesn't persuade Americans to get serious about climate change, nothing will. Well, it was enough to prompt President Obama at his press conference this week to say more about global warming than he did all year. I am a firm believer that climate change is real, that it is impacted by uh, human behavior and carbon emissions. And as a consequence, I think we've got an obligation to future generations to do something about it. But he made it clear that actually doing something about it will take a backseat to the economy for now. He did return to New York on Thursday to review the recovery effort on Staten Island. Climate change and Hurricane Sandy brought Naomi Klein to town, too. You may know her as the author of The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. Readers of two influential magazines put Naomi Klein high on the list of the 100 leading public thinkers in the world. She is now reporting for a new book and documentary, on how climate change can spur political and economic transformation. She's also joined with the environmental writer and activist Bill McKibben in a campaign launched this week called Do the Math. More on that shortly. Naomi Klein, welcome. Thank you so much. First, congratulations on the baby. Thank you so much. How old now? He is five months today. First child? My first child, yeah. How does a child change the way you see the world? Well, it lengthens your timeline, definitely. Uh, I, I'm really immersed in, in climate science right now because of the project I'm working on is related to that. So, you know, there are always these projections into the future. Uh, you know, what's going what's gonna to happen in 2050? What's going to happen in 2080? And I think when you're solo, you, you, you think, okay, well, how old will I be then? Well, you know, and now I'm, I'm thinking, how old will he be <laughs> then, right? And so uh, it's not, you know, but I, I don't like the idea that, Okay, now I care about the future now that I ha- have a child. I think uh, there are, that, that everybody cares about the future, and, uh, and, and I, I cared about it when I didn't have a child, too. <laughs> well, I understand that, but we're so complacent about climate change. A new study shows that uh, while the number of people who believe it's happening has increased by, say, three percentage points yeah. over the last year, yeah. the number of people who think it is human-caused has dropped. It has dropped dramatically. I mean, the statistics on this are quite incredible. If you, 2007, according to a Harris poll, 71% of Americans believed that climate change was real, that it was human caused. And by last year, that number was down to 44%. 71% to 44%. That is an unbelievable drop in belief. But then you look at the coverage that the issues received in the media, and it's also dropped dramatically from that high that high point. 2007, you know, this was this moment where, you know, Hollywood was on board, Vanity Fair launched their annual green issue. Uh, And by the way, there hasn't been an annual green issue since 2008. (laughs) Stars were showing up to the Academy Awards and hybrid cars. And there was a sense, you know, we all have to play our part, uh, including the elites. And that has really been lost. And, And that's why it's got to come from the bottom up this time. But yeah. what do you think happened to diminish the, the enthusiasm for doing something about it, mm-hmm. the attention from the press, the interest of the elite? What is it? I think we're up against a very powerful lobby. And you know, this is the fossil fuel lobby. And they have, a, they have every reason in the world to prevent this from being the most urgent issue that, that on our agenda. And I think, you know, if we look at the history of the environmental movement, going back 25 years to when this issue really broke through, uh, you know, when, when James Hansen testified before Congress. The NASA said, scientist, yes. Exactly, our foremost climate scientist, right. and said, it is happening, and I believe it's human-caused. Um, that, that was the moment where we could no longer deny that we knew. Right? I mean, scientists actually knew w- well beforehand, but that was the breakthrough moment, uh, and, and that was 1988. And if we think about what, what else was happening in the late 80s, well, the Berlin Wall fell the, the next year, and, and the end of history was declared. Yeah. And, you know, th- th- this is, you know, climate change, in a sense, it hit us at the worst possible historical moment because it does require collective action, right? It does require that we, you regulate corporations, that you get, you know, that you 
plan collectively as a society. And at the moment that it hit the mainstream, all of those ideas fell into disrepute, right? It was all supposed to be free market solutions. You were, governments were supposed to get out of the way of corporations. Planning was a dirty word. That was what communists did, right? Um, anything collective was a dirty word. Margaret Thatcher said there's no such thing as society. Now, if you believe that, you can't do anything about climate change because it is the essence of a collective problem. This is the, our collective atmosphere. We can only respond to this collectively. So the environmental movement responded to that by really personalizing the problem and saying, okay, you recycle and you buy a hybrid car and treating this like this could, or we'll have business friendly solutions like cap and trade and carbon offsetting. Um, that doesn't work. So that's part of the problem. So you have this movement that every once in a while would rear up and people would get all excited and we're really going to do something about this and whether it was the Rio summit or the Copenhagen summit or that moment when Al Gore came out with Inconvenient Truth but then it would just recede because it didn't have that collective social support that it needed and on top of that you have we've had this concerted campaign by the fossil fuel lobby to both buy off the environmental movement, to defame the environmental movement, to infiltrate the environmental movement, and to spread lies in the culture. And that's what the climate denial movement has been doing so effectively. I read a piece just this week by the environmental writer Glenn Sherrup. He took a look and finds that over the last two years, the lion's share of the damage from extreme weather, floods, tornadoes, droughts, thunderstorms, windstorms, heat waves, wildfires, has occurred in Republican-leaning red states. Right. But those states have sent a whole new crop of climate change deniers to Congress. If you are deeply invested in this free market ideology, you know, if you really believe with your heart and soul that everything public and, and anything the government does is, is evil and that our liberation will come from liberating corporations, then climate change fundamentally challenges your worldview precisely because we have to regulate. Um, we have to plan. We can't leave everything to the free market. In fact, climate change is, I would argue, the greatest single fr free market failure. Uh, this is what happens when you don't regulate corporations and you allow them to treat the atmosphere as an open sewer. So it isn't just, okay, the fossil fuel companies want to protect their profits. It's that this science threatens a worldview. And when you dig deeper, when you drill deeper into those statistics about the drop in belief in climate change, right. what you see is that Democrats still believe in, in climate change in the 70th percentile. That whole drop of belief, uh, the drop off in belief, has happened on the right side of the political spectrum. So the, the, the most reliable predictor of, uh, of whether or not somebody believes that climate change is real is what their views are on a range of other political subjects. You know, what, what do you think about abortion? What do you, you know, what, are you, what is your view of taxes? Um, and what you find is that people who have very strong conservative political beliefs cannot deal with this science because it threatens everything else they believe. Do you really believe, are you convinced that there are no free market solutions? There's no way to let the market help us solve this crisis? No, absolutely the market can play a role. And you, th there are things that government can can do to incentivize the free market to do a better job. Yes, but is that a replacement for getting in the way actively of the fossil fuel industry and preventing them from destroying our chances of a future on a livable planet? It's not a replacement. We have to do both. President Obama managed to avoid the subject all through the campaign. He hasn't exactly been leading the way. He has not been leading the way. and. In, in fact, you know, he spent a lot of time on the campaign bragging about how much pipeline he's laid down and, and, and this ridiculous notion of an all of the above energy strategy as if you can you know, d develop solar and wind alongside more coal, you know, more oil, more natural gas, and it's all going to work out in the end. No, it just it doesn't add up. And, you know, the, I think, personally, I think the environmental movement has been a little too... Uh, close to Obama, uh, and you know, we've, we learned, for instance, recently that about a meeting that took place shortly after Obama was elected, where the message that all these big green groups got was, we, are do we don't want to talk about climate change, we want to talk about green jobs and energy security, and, and, and a lot of these big green groups played along. So I you feel, mean the big environmental groups? Yeah, the big environmental groups went along with this messaging, talking about energy security uh, instead of talking about climate change because they were told that that wasn't a winnable message. I just think it's wrong. I think it's bad strategy. He got reelected. He got well. He got reelected, but you know what? I think he. 
I think Hurricane Sandy helped Obama get reelected. How so? Well, look at that, the Bloomberg endorsement that came at the last minute. I mean, Bloomberg endorsed Obama because of climate change, because he believed that this was an issue that voters cared enough about that they would, that independence would swing to Obama over climate change. And some of the polling absolutely supports this, that this was one of the reasons why people voted for Obama over Romney was that they, 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 they were concerned about climate change and they felt that he was a better candidate on climate change. So I feel more optimistic than I did in 2008, because I think in 2008, the attitude of the environmental movement was our guy just got in and we need to support him and he's gonna give us the legislation that we, that we want and we're gonna take his advice and we're gonna be good little soldiers. And now, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but I think that, that, that people learned the lesson of the past four years and people now understand that what Obama needs, and what we need, forget what Obama needs, is a real independent movement with climate change at its center, and that's going to put pressure on the entire political class and directly on the fossil fuel companies on this issue. And, and there's no waiting around for Obama to do it for you. Why would you think that the next four years of a lame <laughs> duck president would be more successful from your standpoint than the first four years when he's looking to re-election? Well, I think on the one hand, we're gonna see more direct action. But the other strategy is to go where the problem is, and the problem is the companies themselves. And we're, we're, we're launching the, the Do the Math Tour, which is actually trying to kick off a divestment movement. I mean, we're going after these companies where it hurts, which is, which is their portfolios, which is their stock price. And You're asking people to disinvest, to take their money out of universities in particular. Right? Yeah. This is what happened during the fight against apartheid in South Africa, and ultimately proved successful. Yeah, and this is, we are modeling it on the anti-apartheid divestment movement. Um, and, and, and the reason it's called Do the Math is because of this new body of research that, ca that came out last year, a, a group in, in, in Britain called the Carbon Tracker Initiative. And this is you know, a fairly conservative group that addresses itself to the financial community. This is not you know, sort of activist right. research. This is a group that uh, identified a market bubble and we're concerned about what this meant to investors. Mm. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty conservative take on it. And, and what the numbers that they crunched uh, found is that if we're gonna ward off truly catastrophic climate change, we need to keep the increase, uh, the temperature increase below two degrees centigrade. The problem with that is that they also measured how much the fossil fuel companies and countries who own their own national oil reserves have now currently in their reserves, which means they have already laid claim to this. They already own it. It's already inflating their stock price, okay? So how much is that? It's five times more. So that means that the whole business model for the fossil fuel industry is based on burning five times more carbon than is compatible with a livable planet. So what we're saying is your business model is at war with life on this planet. It's at war with us and we need to fight back. So, so we're saying these are rogue companies. And we think, in particular, young people whose whole future lies ahead of them have to send a message to their universities who, you know, almost every university has a huge endowment, and there isn't an endowment out there that doesn't have holdings in these fossil fuel companies. And so young people are saying to the people who charged with their education, charged with preparing them for the outside world, for their future jobs, explain to me how you can prepare me for a future that with your actions you're demonstrating you don't believe it. How can you prepare me for a future at the same time as you bet against my future with these fossil fuel holdings? You do the math and you tell me. And I, I think there's a tremendous moral uh, moral clarity that comes from having that kind of a youth-led movement. So, so we're really excited about it.